be with you. Well, this morning uh, we have the privilege of having in our pulpit our very own Amber Simpson. Uh, one of the great things about our church that most of you know, but may be a surprise to a few of you, is that we believe that our sisters are as equally called to this gospel ministry as our brothers. And Amber and Scotty both have been, uh, mem- or been students at Central, uh, they still have the word Baptist there, Central Baptist Theological Seminary. And Amber this semester is a part of that, has a mentoring component, and part of that is that she has to preach. And I don't know, taking a Sunday to let someone else preach it didn't sound like a bad idea to me. And so, and I'm looking forward to having Amber here. Pray for Amber as she comes, but also be praying for her as she is also in conversation uh, with a a congregation now to be called on on their staff uh, in the coming weeks. So just be praying for her and that discernment there. But Amber, we pray for you as you come and bring God's word for us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, And we'll be reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. And we'll be reading through verse 21. Um, And as you turn there, I want to express my gratitude to you, my church, and to my pastor, Chris Thomas, for allowing me to complete my internship in pastoral leadership this term. For those of you who don't know, as as Chris already mentioned, I am in my third year of four years um, of seminary. As part of this learning journey, I am charged to the task of preaching. It's a very scary task. Um, And I thought, what better way to be a part of this than to do it at First Baptist Church of Williams? I call you home. I call you family, and that's, I'm very thankful for that. Um, And I'm I'm also thankful for the grace you're going to extend to me this morning. (laughs) So I hope that you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version this morning. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men and women. But we are well known to God. And I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf. That you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus. That if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he and she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to God's self through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to God's self, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you now with open hearts and clear minds. Let us seek peace and listen to you this day. I desire your own words over mine. Let your breath be heard, O God. I pray this day that I do not hinder your message or your voice. Amen. Growing up, I wanted bad eyesight. Yes, it's true. All because I desperately wanted the need for eyeglasses. 
You see, my dad had really bad vision, and every year we would take a trip to my dad's optometrist, Dr. Boozer. I think some of you are very familiar with a specific Dr. Brian Boozer of Coleman, Alabama. We would walk into that office, and I would walk over to the great big wall of eyeglasses and try pair after pair on while we waited. There were red ones, square ones, sports kinds, and the kinds that made you look really smart. When they called my dad's name, the three of us would file into that little examination room in the back. My dad would sit in the patient's chair in that dim lit room, and Dr. Boozer would complete the routine examination. When the appointment was over, my dad would get to pick out a new pair of frames that would eventually hold his thick lenses. Now, my dad rarely ever picked out new frames, but instead he would choose the same 1970s metal frames, you know, the ones with the eyepieces that would get really, really dirty and green from all the wear and tear and the gunk. And now I remember one particular occasion when I was around six years old, going to my dad's eye appointment and my mom told me that I too would be getting an examination. Excitement filled me to the brim. I now had a mission. I would be leaving that appointment too with a new pair of eyeglasses. But there was just one small problem. I had fine vision. I could see a-okay, no problem at all. I was so desperate though to pick out a new pair of really cool glasses. So I thought, I am going to intentionally fail that examination probably the only examination I've ever intentionally tried to fail. Oh yes, I, small six-year-old, was going to outsmart Dr. Boozer, the eye professional, and prove that my eyesight was indeed bad enough to get a pair of glasses. Now you may ask, Amber, why on earth do you want a pair of eyeglasses? I mean, I've had a pair since I was old enough to see, and I've been trying to get contacts ever since. Well, I saw this as a great opportunity to change my look. I could seek out a new identity. At the ripe old age of six, I could be anyone I wanted. I could look like a pro basketball player, or a NASA astrophysicist, or America's next top model. Yeah, well, we see how all that turned out. I could even put on my purple pair of colored Converse, rolled up jeans, flannel, and match it perfectly with a pair of thick, black, hipster eyeglasses. I mean, it was, the ni it was 1997. Uh, no one could fault me for that. With eyeglasses, there were endless, endless possibilities in which I could see myself. As I waited for them to call my name, I tried on various pairs with my mission in mind. Not only did each pair change the way I looked, but they changed the way I saw the world. Now, as you can see now, I'm not wearing glasses. So I did not do a very good job that day outsmarting Dr. Boozer. But I am reminded of this story as I read what the Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to the Church of Corinth. Paul's words are beckoning us to use a lens similar to the one we use to view Jesus Christ. When Christ was human, people observed him from a human perspective. Some individuals put on nice, neat frames with lenses that allowed them to see the holiness that Jesus embodied. Others put on perfectly round, rose-colored glasses and saw that they didn't need this guy, Jesus. Everything is fine. There's no reason why he needs to come and change things. Then there were some that put on glasses for the very first time, not being able to see it all until Jesus showed up. Nonetheless, People base their judgment about Jesus on fleshly details. However, through the resurrection, Jesus changes our vision. And now we identify that Christ's spirit is intertwined with God, by which God restores the world to God's self. And it is through these same optics we are able to see ourselves and experience God. Now Paul goes on to say in verse 17, I'm going to reread it, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Looking at another reading, the message translation uses renditions of this passage that provide much insight. 
it puts verse 17 this way. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start and is created new. The old life is gone. A new life burgeons. Look at it. We are new creation. And we do not have to give attention to our flaws and insecurities. But we can focus on the liberating freedom Christ provides. I can put on the proverbial spectacles that allow me to see myself as beloved, grace-filled, and a creative co-laborer with God. This idea of new creation is not stagnant either. It is not a singular instance in which we become a shiny new human, never to be tarnished again. Becoming a new creation is not, only, is not a one-time deal, and if we fail, we are separated from it all. God did not intend for it to be an exclusive club. It is not a, I've got it all figured out, and if you don't, you can't be a part of it mentality. That is not God's intentions. The act of becoming new is a constant transformative renewal system, and it is ever-present. Paul writes, all things have become new, in which he uses the perfect tense rather than past tense, implying that it is a journey, not a solitary occasion. This newness is something that we are continuing toward and will not achieve in a singular instance. There is no, I have arrived, moment. Also, let's not confuse the phrase new creation with the human idea of perfection. Our goal is not to work towards and achieve perfection. In doing so, our lens can become narrow in the pursuit of it, and we begin to beat ourselves up over the lack thereof. Oh, and the anxiety that comes attached to the desire of perfection? I become paralyzed by the fact that I'm not going to be the best wife, the best mom, the best sister, the best friend, the best coworker, the best leader, the best follower, the best listener, the best speaker, the best teacher. The list can go on and on. I get so caught up into what I think God wants me to be, absolutely blameless, flawless, without, without any kind of error. I, I get so caught up in it that I've, I lose my ability to see the person God has already made me through Jesus Christ, full of grace, full of hope, full of life. So what is this foundational substance that we should view ourselves? What shade, I guess, of character should our glasses be tinted? This inward lens, this Christ lens, this manner in which we view ourselves, it doesn't come from a vantage point of shame or judgment. No, Christ empowers us to put on glasses that allow us to fully see and experience the love of God within us. That foundational substance is love. That shade of character should be the color of love. And it is with the same pair of glasses we should outwardly view the world. But why does all this matter? Why is it important for us to see ourselves as new creation? This powerful lens will be the tool we can give others so that they can see themselves in a similar way. Now, please don't hear me say that we can give someone a lens that, that will allow them to see themselves like us. But rather, let's help others put on a lens that will provide unity in Christ, and it comes from a spiritual similarity, not a physical sameness. I don't believe God wants us to think we have the right lens and others have defected ones. That's not what Paul is saying either. And, and coming from this perspective, we can empower those around us who see themselves as broken, irrelevant creatures and believe the lie that they are not loved. When the boss lets you go and the bills just don't get paid, when the doctor calls with really bad news, when the devastation is incomprehensible, when the pain is just too unbearable, when hope is fading and the shade of our glasses gets darker and darker with each passing day until it gets dark and we no longer are able to see. Here, take my pair. We are called to share freely our Christ lenses with one another without motives, hidden agendas, or insurmountable expectations. 
Paul is urging us to meet people where they are and show them that they are courageous and beautiful in the midst of the pain. He is calling us to show them that they too should put on the image of God glasses and see themselves in a whole new light. They too were created in God's holy image. And in turn, this sacred unity has the capacity for holy relationship. You see, Paul speaks of this word reconciliation. He says it over and over again in this, in this text. Um, other words for reconciliation is restoration or renewal. He says that God has reconciled our relationship with God, and we can fully live in that reconciliation through Christ Jesus. And this relationship, as Paul puts it, for all. Christ died for all so that all things become new. In other words, everything is included in this relationship. And if God doesn't exclude anyone, then why should we? This includes our friends, our enemies, our neighbors down the street, our neighbors on the other side of the world, those of different race, gender, age, socioeconomics, political status, that list can go on as well. This loving relationship God calls us to transcends boundaries and forces us to put our differences aside. Our imperative relationship with God is the springboard that we use to build relationships with others. We are to be what, God, what Paul calls us in verse 20, ambassadors to Christ, torchbearers of love and inclusive for all human beings, no matter who they are or where they come from. God calls us to be generous with those glasses, those glasses in which we see ourselves as loved and through which we see others as beloved children of God. Let us allow Christ to transform our vision. Let us to help others see Christ. Let us be a lens of love, both inward and outward. Let us pray. Great God, loving Christ, Holy Spirit, we come to you now, searching our hearts for the love you have instilled in all of us. I pray that it becomes primary nature to look through the spectacles of love as you have called us to do so earnestly. I pray that as we leave this place, we are quick to build relationships with others and we let love be our only motive. I pray, O oh God, that we see ourselves as beloved collaborators with each other and with you, the one who makes us new creation. Renew our spirits and restore our souls as we continue this journey together in your name. Amen.